Thank you very much for the invitation. It's great to um, get to share this work. I, um, um, as Bert said, I'm a social epidemiologist and really my interest in instrumental variable methods emerged around social determinants of health. But today I'm gonna to talk about really focusing on Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And the, the reason that I think I think that, that IV methods have been sort of given short shrift in epidemiology in many ways, but that they are particularly pertinent and powerful in considering um, uh, problems related to Alzheimer's dementia. So I'm going to spend um, a little bit of time describing what I mean by IV inspired approaches and linking it to causal frameworks that, that people um, are probably familiar with at Harvard. And um, I had hoped to put in three examples, but I think I can only fit in two examples realistically. So I took out my second, my disease prevention example. But if anybody, if we have time for questions and anybody has a question, I'd love to talk about it. Um, uh, so let me just start by talking about IV inspired approaches. So if, you're, if your goal is to evaluate whether some exposure influences an outcome, X causes Y, um, the Pearl framework kind of says, look, we can have these three sort of um, three sort of approaches. One approach, which should be familiar to any observational epidemiologist, is the idea that you measure or you identify a variable that's on every backdoor path. And by a backdoor path, I mean a path um, connecting your exposure and outcome that emanates with an arrow that begins with an arrow into your exposure. So we call this a backdoor path. And the conventional approach to observational epidemiology including approaches, um, uh, typical marginal structural model approaches, are, are based on um, measuring and blocking all backdoor paths. Um, things like propensity score um, approaches, inverse probability weighting. A second approach, which is really conceptually pretty distinct, is to block all the front door paths. I won't talk about this because there's some controversy about whether it's ever useful. I recently read a paper which said it had it was presenting the first credible example ever of the front door criterion. Um, uh, so I won't spend I won't belabor it much except to acknowledge that there is this method we never use. And then the third approach is based on using an instrumental variable. The instrumental variable approach should be familiar to epidemiologists as what we call randomized control trials. Randomized controlled trials are a beautiful example of an instrumental variable approach, which we um, uh, probably could take more full advantage of if we framed it as an instrumental variable. But there are many other settings where there's not an intentionally randomized trial, there's sort of a quasi experiment or a natural experiment that we can, that in fact we can use as an instrumental variable. And the idea of an IV approach is that there's some exposure that induces variation in your exposure. Um, and is otherwise unrelated to the potential outcome of your, um, of your dependent variable setting any particular value of X. So we need an instrument, in this case Z, that is uh, associated with X and has no direct effects on Y that are not mediated by X and has no common causes with um, Y that are not at least controlled. So those are the three kinds of approaches. And um, the reality is that observational epi leans very, very heavily on backdoor paths or what I'll call covariate control approaches. And when I was in training, in fact, this was very heavily emphasized and um, uh, almost nobody used instrumental variables except for some economists who were in the health policy. Um, and I was a little bit surprised when I realized that in fact, there's a very large discipline that's adjacent to epidemiology called economics, where they take IV methods as the default method, and they find um, covariate control methods totally implausible. And I made this little cartoon, which I think um, actually is pretty descriptive of the disciplinary perspectives. For epidemiologists, we think if we, we can measure and perfectly model all conceivable factors that influence complex exposures and outcomes. That's what we think we're gonna do with our backdoor uh, covariate control observational epi. And whereas economists, um, they say, oh, we're gonna identify a naturally occurring source of randomization that operates exclusively through the exposure I care about in the population I care about, no problem. Um, another way of saying this is epidemiologists think this DAG is much more, more plausible, whereas economists think this DAG is much more plausible. I think that, uh, Reasonably people, people can see that actually both DAGs represent pretty strong assumptions. And in many real applications of complex exposures and outcomes, we have a lot of reason to be skeptical of either um, causal structure. 
And Ellie Mate, who's a postdoc uh, with my group, who just actually, she's really now her own postdoc. She's a K on a K99. But she wrote this really nice paper sort of contrasting these two approaches and really arguing for the value of integrating those perspectives because both approaches really involve trade-offs and assumptions. And both approaches invoke assumptions that cannot be directly proven true. Um, so, so the preferred approach is gonna depend on the details of the setting and the limitations of previous work in the area, i.e. triangulation. But in many cases, it's very useful to, to think about how do we combine both types of study design to um, be most convincing. Um, when thinking about the trade-offs, you might prefer confounder, control, or backdoor approaches when the timing of the incidence of the outcome, when the outcome develops, is clearly identifiable. You can clearly say, here's the start of the outcome, here's the start of the event, um, because that enables you to unequivocally establish temporal order of exposure and outcome, and therefore plausibly identify prior causes of the exposure and the outcome. On the other hand, you might prefer I IV-based approaches if you can identify a factor that influences or correlates with the exposure and it's plausibly independent of potential outcomes. And in fact, you probably often want to use both. If possible, if the plausible causal structures violating the backdoor path assumptions in this DAG are different than the plausible causal structures violating the IV assumptions in this DAG, i.e. so you have two different sets of, of causal structures, if you can try to triangulate those, you're going to be able to make a much more compelling argument. I think Alzheimer's disease and dementia um, uh, are in fact a case where this is really helpful to where we have exactly the kinds of settings where backdoor um, path approaches, confounder control don't work well. Um, and IV has a lot of promise. Most work to date has leveraged covariate control and backdoor approaches. Um, so in fact, if you look at the, at the most of the research on uh, the epi on um, Alzheimer's disease and dementia, what you see is it relies on many, many papers rely on very similar assumptions, which are never established as true. And on the face of it, do not seem likely to be true. Um, so paper after paper, we see assuming um, these exchangeability assumptions that are hard to believe. Um, whereas confirmation or disconfirmation with instrumental variables has to date been rare. So I think that there's just in the sense that a new domain is gonna be more um, fruitful. I think there, there's a lot to be said for IV. Alzheimer's disease and other causes of dementia almost certainly have long insidious development periods. And we don't actually know how long. So that's actually one of the things I'm gonna talk about for an application, but we do think that it's quite long. So therefore it's very tough to measure the onset of the disease. So it's very difficult to say, to establish clearly that we've actually gotten an exposure that's definitely prior to the onset of disease, much less confounders that are definitely prior to the onset of disease. Um, and there are numerous confounders across the life course because Alzheimer's and dementia are deeply socially patterned. So there's essentially no age at which a cognitive assessment does not predict late onset dementia. So every study, no matter what age, so you can go back, you can say, okay, the typical age of diagnosis is in the 70s or 80s. If you look back in people's 40s, cognition predicts. If you look back at people's college age, cognition predicts. Age 11 test scores predict late onset dementia. So throughout life, these um, social patterns, and, and I'm just using cognitive tests as a proxy for you know, socioeconomic status, parental education, all of these factors predict um, late onset dementia and predict the life course uh, risk factors. So there are numerous confounders and it's really tough to make the compelling case that we've actually captured all of those confounders. These are the reasons why IV seems particularly relevant. Now that I've given this sort of argument for IV in general, I, um, the most classic IV example I took out of this talk, which the most classic IV example, I had used a policy change to estimate the effect of education on um, uh, late life cognitive impairment. I took that out uh, just because I, in the interest of time, said I'm gonna talk about two somewhat non-traditional applications of IV that I think are really potentially informative. Um, the first one is really a, um, the first one is really focused on this simple question of when should we actually start thinking about prevention for Alzheimer's disease? How early do we need to go to think about prevention? 
this is an important question because we are in a phase with Alzheimer's disease and dementia where um, study after study with pharmaceutical interventions have, have failed. And we, one of the common explanations given is that we're not starting early enough, that we're starting too late in the disease. Um, but conceptually, if you want to think about prevention, you probably need to think about when the disease actually begins, when the pathophysiology actually begins. Um, a related question is, is about sort of really understanding the timing of the initiating processes in disease. Um, we, the amyloid cascade hypothesis, which is the predominant biological theory for, for what, uh, what causes Alzheimer's disease, really posits that uh, amyloid is the first biomarker change associated with Alzheimer's. And I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of the Jack model of disease, which is almost required for a, an Alzheimer's talk, but the Jack model of disease proposes the first biological change is a set of, of amyloid markers, which leads to subsequent changes in tau and finally manifests in, cogn in cognition. Um, but is that the case? Is amyloid really the leading marker of, of disease? To understand that, we need to see, are there other things that might be changing earlier that would make us be worried? Um, this is work of Dr. Willow Brenowitz, who was a postdoc and is now faculty at UCSF. Um, so the earliest age of pathology, when pathology begins, is in fact still uncertain. Here is a picture from Elizabeth Rose Maeda's work. And, um, uh, Dr. Maeda shows, this is just data from the Kaiser Permanente data, uh, data set. And you can see this is, but this is very typical. What's beautiful about this paper is just that it's uh, got very precise estimates for many different racial ethnic groups. Uh, but what you can see is that the onset is, is really predominant in late 70s and early 80s. But diagnosis we do think begins long after disease. Um, and that has guided and influenced the way that trials are designed. So for example, the A4 trial is targeting cognitively normal older adults whose brain scans show evidence of amyloid buildup, but their eligibility is age 65 plus. So even though people are thinking the disease must begin earlier, we're still in our interventions, mostly focusing on older adults. But realistically, is this early enough for prevention? We wanted to think about this as a way, so, so our goal here is to say, can we pick up earlier signs, earlier manifestations that are clearly manifest or that are likely manifestations of disease? And if so, how early? Um, and we started thinking about this with respect to body mass index. And the reason we started with BMI is we were, we were thinking about BMI because it's a, it's, a, it's a very weird risk factor for Alzheimer's disease in that elevated BMI in midlife predicts higher risk of dementia in late life, but elevated BMI in late life predicts lower risk. And this flip, um, it has been assumed is happening because in fact, incipient Alzheimer's disease causes people to lose weight. Um, but when does that actually happen? Now, disentangling this is actually pretty important to understand whether we should be um, uh, how we should be handling BMI in late life as well, but that's a side, side problem. So, so we wanna say, when does dementia-related weight loss begin? Um, and this is tricky because high midlife BMI predicts dementia. So uh, throughout much of midlife and the incipient years of, de of dementia onset or Alzheimer's beginning, you're gonna see, what you actually see is a combination of both Alzheimer's, uh, BMI, high BMI increasing Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's disease reducing BMI. So you're gonna see those two processes together and it's gonna be hard to pick up early manifestations of Alzheimer's in weight loss. So our approach here was to think about genetic instrumental variables for AD to try to establish the temporal order. Um, so <clears throat> here's the picture. We've got an Alzheimer's disease genetic risk score, I should say, Alzheimer's disease is actually a complex outcome for which there is a pretty reasonably functional um, genetic risk score. It is dominated by APOE4, um, but there are many other alleles that, that together predict um, Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, so we've got an Alzheimer's disease genetic risk score that we are pretty confident influences preclinical dementia. Uh, we just don't know at what age that starts to manifest. We've got high body mass index, which we think also increases preclinical dementia. 
<laughs> and uh, we're going to look at we're going to look for weight loss as an indicator. So. Um, if AD genetic risk score should not predict lower BMI um, if the preclinical dementia has not started, and AD genetic risk score should predict lower BMI if preclinical dementia has started to, to manifest. The way that we approached this was using the UK Biobank data set. The UK Biobank has lots of challenges and limitations. It has one huge advantage, which is that it's very large. Um, so we have about 400,000 people ages 40 to 69, and in that data set, we can create AD and AD genetic risk score, um, which we were using an old uh, genetic risk score, but it, the results don't change much if you update the genetic risk score, uh, based on 23 polymorphisms that were previously confirmed to increase Alzheimer's disease risk, including ApoE4 alleles. Body mass index is measured at study enrollment. And we used uh, mixed models. We estimate a mixed model regressing BMI on age, age squared, and the interaction of both with continuous Alzheimer's disease. Um, so we use this to basically predict the curves of BMI for people with a 10th and 90th percentile of AD risk. This is essentially the predicted model. So the black line are people with high Alzheimer's disease genetic risk, and the red line are people with low Alzheimer's disease genetic risk. Now, at the earliest ages, you do not expect the Alzheimer's disease genetic risk score to predict BMI at all. It's a genetic risk score for Alzheimer's disease, not for BMI. And in fact, that's exactly what you see. At the very earliest stages of the UK Biobank participants, these look really similar. The AD genetic risk score is just not associated with your BMI. But as you get older, so by age 70, people who have low AD genetic risk score clearly have um, higher BMI than people with high AD genetic risk score. Again, out here, this is also pretty consistent with what we see in general in that people with Alzheimer's disease or right before they get Alzheimer's disease clearly have weight loss and they have lower BMI. So this is not surprising that people in their up to age 70 who we think are approaching the time that they might be diagnosable with dementia have started to, to lose weight. What's really interesting and amazing here is the age at which you start to see this divergence. And the age at which you actually start to see this divergence is basically around age 50. Now, um, age 47, technically. Uh, there's a little bit of noise here, I would say, in terms of when, when things really, really diverge. Um, so that's roughly 25 to 30 years prior to the average age of diagnosis. Um, this to me is really, the implications here are really interesting in that it suggests physiologic changes in BMI are beginning to emerge in late, late 40s. I will say we're replicating this with other, other measures from the um, uh, UK Biobank and results are pretty similar somewhere in the 40s. We would not be able to pick up anything that happened earlier, but pretty consistently um, for many phenotypes we can see that the AD genetic risk score is beginning to predict outcomes by uh, late, mid to late 40s. Um, there are some caveats here, of course. The UK Biobank is a really strange sample. It's high socioeconomic status. They're very healthy. They were cognitive, presumably cognitively normal at baseline. Um, it's completely cross-sectional. We are faking a, a longitudinal data set by looking at age, but these are all between person comparisons. And one of the biggest pushbacks we've gotten about this is the idea that the BMI change is attributable to pleiotropic effects of the genetic variants, not due to the actual pathophysiology that, that ultimately culminates in Alzheimer's disease. I think that's possible. It is surprising that it starts to emerge, that there, it's not there um, in, in earlier life and it starts to emerge in, in midlife. Um, and given that we, really think there is something happening related to weight loss and Alzheimer's disease. That doesn't seem like the simplest interpretation of the results, but it, it's possible. Um, but I think the implications here are really that we, if we actually are interested in prevention, we need to totally reframe when we're thinking about this disease. And, and prevention is going to be somewhere between age 45 and 55, um, as opposed to age 65 to 75. Um, all right, so that was that example with uh, Willow Brenowitz's work. And now I wanna talk about more uh, 
work that's about disease treatment. And this is actually a very tidy example, in some ways, tidy example of ID analyses that I think is potentially useful more broadly. <laughs> in that, as I said, when I introduced the distinction between covariate control or backdoor path um, approaches and IV approaches, randomized control trials are the perfect IV um, in that randomization is what we mean by an instrumental variable. Um, so we were interested in using, random, using the IV approach to integrate coefficients for uh, based on randomized control trials of amyloid reduction. Um, so this is work of Sarah Ackley, who's a postdoctoral fellow with my group. And the goal here is to reevaluate trial data to test a mechanistic hypothesis that has been motivating medication development. So the primary target of many, many trials to treat dementia or prevent conversion from MCI or early dementia to later, uh, more severe uh, flavors of the disease, the primary target has been reduction of amyloid plaques in the brain or some flavor of amyloid in the brain. Individual trials have mostly failed to improve um, cognition. There have been some ambiguous results um, and many of the trials, there is evidence that they have in fact reduced amyloid, but um, have not improved cognition or have not improved it noticeably. Of course, it's possible that those trials um, have been underpowered and that if you could combine the results, you would actually see a benefit for cognition. Um, so our goal was to combine the trials and use it to derive an estimate of the effect of amyloid reduction on cognition. Now, one challenge, you can't directly combine the trials because different drugs have different magnitudes of effect on amyloid. So of course you need to incorporate an understanding of the magnitude of the effect on amyloid in, in, before you're combining the trial results. You can't directly combine the intent to treat effect estimates. Um, so our goal was to, to use instrumental variables analysis to basically scale the trial based on the magnitude of the effect of each drug on amyloid. Most of the studies report grouped data by randomization arm. So many trials have multiple doses of drugs. So some drugs will reduce amyloid a lot, some, uh, or and then they'll have a lighter dose that will reduce amyloid a little. We wanted to take advantage of that. Um, these, uh, and, and they will often report these, the group data, the extent of reduction in amyloid, and then the cognitive outcome in each of the randomization arms. For most trials, because neuroimaging is expensive, the measure of the amyloid reduction, um, typically here we focused on measures that were based on um, uh, PET imaging, the, the measure of amyloid reduction was for a subset of individuals who, for whom they could do imaging. And just be, I think that that's typically because of the logistics and, and expense of the neuroimaging. So what we've got here are grouped data by randomization arm and a cognitive measure and um, including uh, neuroimaging data. So Sarah searched for all trials with published results, including any phase. Um, uh, she restricted to those that had a neuroimaging measure of amyloid. Um, one of the things that was amazing about this was how many weird, surprising things there were in the trials. Like as a social epidemiologist, I've always been kind of uh, jealous of people who could run these beautiful drug trials and how tidy and clean and clear they would be. When you actually look under the hood, it's a mess. Like they have protocol changes and um, uh, change different rules for randomizing people based on genotype. And some of those rules, they would change in the middle of the trial. So it's actually much harder to interpret these, these uh, individual studies. We um, extracted the data from these published results. We used the papers. We used reports from um, uh, uh, clinicaltrials.gov. In some cases, uh, what had been released was a press release, which uh, often preceded huge changes in share price. And so we were reduced to measuring things with a, with a ruler. Uh, to get our effect estimates. We wrote all the companies. In one case, we got a company to give us new data. Um, and uh, in most cases, we got nothing back from the companies. Um, and we put all of this together and uh, basically derived a maximum likelihood estimator, which uh, 
it's a little non-traditional because of the summary data and inconsistent sample sizes between the number of randomized, the number with neuroimaging data, and the number with a cognitive outcome. And you can think of that in the same way if you're familiar with Mendelian randomization studies where they've got these two-stage studies and they'll have different sample sizes for the two stages. That's essentially what this is doing. So um, we, this is based on the principles of linear instrumental variables models. We assume randomization to treatment arm reduced amyloid, that we assume that amyloid influence cognition, and we assume that randomization has no other influence on cognition. That's the weak, I will flag that that is the most troubling assumption I, in my view uh, in, our, in our analysis. Um, and then we can meta-analyze the results of all the trials. Um, so this is just, just goes through the search uh, criteria. We ended up with eight drugs evaluated in 14 trials with 40 randomization arms. Um, a big discussion in the review of this paper was that results for many, many trials were not available. Uh, we feel that it is reasonable to assume that if a company had a drug that improved cognition, it would get those results out that the world would know about it because there's like a gazillion dollars on the line. Um, and so we suspect that the bias here, any bias here is likely to be um, in favor of things looking better in our analysis than they actually are if we had all the data. Um, so what you see, these are, so this is the, these are the drug specific uh, trial and drug specific estimates. So the zero here is amyloid reduction has no um, effect. On the left is amyloid reduction is harmful. On the right, amyloid reduction is helpful. Um, here are the coefficients. And uh, we, I should say, we are using MMSE as the outcome. We were forced to use MMSE as the outcome, as our primary outcome, just because it is the, outcome that is most commonly reported across all trials. We did some crosswalking between um, approach between outcomes so that we could sort of integrate results. Results didn't didn't differ qualitatively, but I do think that the MMSE results are probably the best of, of the approaches. Um, so you can see there are actually quite a few results and um, they're they're mostly non-significant, but it might be worth combining them. And when you combine them, what you see is the overall effect of all from all trials. Um, here's the coefficient 0.034. So this is a coefficient for a 0.1 unit reduction in um, standard unit value uptake ratio, standard uptake value ratio, which is essentially the measure of amyloid burden in the brain. Um, so a 0.1 unit reduction was, was um, predicting about a 0.03 improvement in MMSE. You might say, well, what's realistic? Like how much could a drug influence SUVR? Could we do, is, is 0.1 a big or a small effect? Um, the largest achieved effect in any trial arm was a 0.3 unit reduction, just to give you a scale of what, what we're doing with our drugs. Um, Sorry, I think I didn't multiply that out right. So, so you get about 0 0.9, 0 uh, 0.1 unit effect with that large, that magnitude of effect. Just for comparison, if you think about the effect of APOE4, <clears throat> the APOE4 allele was associated with about 0.7 to negative 0.1 um, units per year in these in these trial data. So the effect, the plausible effect of amyloid is way smaller than what what in these populations the APOE4 allele was doing. Um, and I think that you that even if you look at the upper bound of our effect estimate, it's much smaller than the most generous interpretation of APOE4. Um, we did some sensitivity analyses restricting to antibody data using only the published results, using all the published antibody results and nothing looks very convincing. And what I wanna say here, the thing that we think is really useful here is um, as much as the point estimate is the confidence interval and that the confidence interval is telling us this is not likely to be a big effect within the range of plausible changes. Um, we had a lot of, we considered this data to be rapidly changing and these findings to be rapidly changing. Um, so we actually put all of this into a shiny app and posted the Shiny app online. And we 
here is the link. Um, and here's a picture from the Shiny app. And this is anybody, it is pre-populated with our data. So it's pre-populated with all the numbers that we use. However, if you happen to be a pharmaceutical company and you have better data, you can add your own data and uh, rerun the analyses. And it's all there up on a Shiny app that, that Scott Zimmerman, who's sort of an amazing analyst in my group, wrote. And you can redo it and add new data or see what would these results look like if we had a hypothetical new trial that, that had particular results. Um, could, we, could we get these things to look better? <clears throat> um, so the IV reanalysis of trials, the limitations here are we made linear IV modeling assumptions. Um, we did some sensitivity analyses, but there's still that's still an important assumption. Uh, there are challenges in that there are variations in the tracer that were used for amyloid in these different um, studies. So crosswalking between the tracers. We tried to do centelloid transformations. I don't think that's totally solid because the, we, there's just not enough information. Um, uh, MMSE is not the best cognitive assessment, obviously. Um, I feel like Mayor, I can see Mayor there. I feel like Mayor is recalling the debates about the MMSE for my dissertation. And <laughs> um, uh, but it is commonly used. And I would say that a lot of the things about MMSE that are not good in healthy populations are actually not such a problem in these studies because many of these studies, I don't remember the mean MMSE, but the mean MMSE is like the mid twenties. Um, so in fact, we don't have a lot of people who are scoring at the ceiling. Um, uh, so the MMSE has a much better potential than you might expect for detecting changes. Um, we certainly have missing studies. Again, we think that the bias is probably making amyloid look better than it is, if anything. Um, and I think most importantly, amyloid probably takes longer to have an effect. If there's any effect of amyloid, it's probably not going to be in the time frame of these studies. But that in itself really is important to think about the design of studies. In that we're ran, we're running. This is the design of the trials that we've been we've been fielding. And if it's going to take an extra decade to see a benefit of amyloid, we need to incorporate that understanding into our um, trial design. <clears throat> Um, so the bottom line, amyloid reduction on the established on an established scale within the timeline of typical trials is unlikely to have notable cognitive benefits. Um, and you know, when we've been we published this when this paper was just accepted uh, very recently, it'll be forthcoming in BMJ. And the pushback we got, some of the pushback was about, well, it's not so important that that you've shown this thing about amyloid per se. But yet, I think that even though there has been d debate about the importance of amyloid, there is still a default that amyloid is really critical to the disease. And in fact, it's now incorporated as a defining as the, the defining feature of the disease, a defining feature of the disease, and that attacking amyloid is critical to attacking um, Alzheimer's. This is just a quote from um, Ron Peterson, who's one of the most uh, extremely prestigious, renowned Alzheimer's disease researchers about the importance of um, amyloid. And that was sort of given in the wake of a failed amyloid targeting trial. So the failures of these trials are not really changing the interpretation that amyloid is important. The other thing I wanna say is that this is, this is particularly, um, it feels very, very timely right now because there's a debate about, a specific, about FDA approval about, of a drug that targets amyloid and uh, it, with the intention of improving, uh, delaying Alzheimer's onset or, or reducing transition to severe Alzheimer's. Um, there have been, so we identified 14 trials. It's actually kind of surprising that with 14 trials and 40 randomization arms, we don't see more statistically significant effects. You just try over and over again, you're likely to find something eventually. Um, and we actually think this is important when we're thinking about any drug, that we should be using this framework to say, look, if you have a common biological target, if you have an argument about this is the mechanism via which this drug is supposed to work, and you have a class of drugs that are working on the same mechanism, that you should incorporate information about the effect of that biological mechanism. And I don't think we've been standardly doing that because it's, you can't, it's not obvious how to do it with intent to treat effect estimates. IV methods put 
put these on the same scale and allow you to easily meta analyze on a common scale. So I think this is just a tool that is very is widely useful potentially if you have a, a clearly defined and measurable biological target of a drug um, proposal. Um, so I, I think that it's valuable to consider pooled evidence um, from all available trials to contextualize results from any single trial. Right now, Educanumab, as I mentioned, is up for review. This is incredibly controversial. Um, <laughs> um, this is incredibly controversial because there's so much there's so much money riding on it. People are so desperate for a treatment for Alzheimer's. I mean, everyone is desperate for a treatment for Alzheimer's that work. But the reality is, um, this is supposed to work by amyloid reduction. There are two trials. One is statistically significant. One isn't. The original FDA clinical evaluation said this drug is awesome. Yay, we have a solution. The statistical evaluation said this is crazy. This is absolutely not acceptable. And the, the evidence is not compelling at all. And we still don't know. Um, uh, the, the FDA advisory committee is supposed to make a final decision in March. We think that the background of repeated failures of amyloid drugs targeting the same mechanism is really relevant for um, interpreting these results, especially when the company argues that you should basically look together at their two studies. They're, they're not willing to say one disconfirms the other. Um, seems like you should integrate the evidence more broadly. All right, that is the end of my talk. I will thank my amazing team. I, um, yeah, I'll thank my amazing team, the National Institute on Aging, who has funded a lot of this work I'm really grateful for, um, and the Methods Longitudinal Research on Dementia Group. If anybody is interested in methods in longitudinal research on dementia, that's the place to be. Let me know, and I'm happy to sign you up. Um, and I'll stop there and take questions or discussion.